Okay, thanks very much for the invitation and nice introduction. So I see uh, that many people will talk about expandable clustering. So it's a very popular topic uh, these days. And, and I think even we will also talk about similar algorithms. So, so there will be a chance for repetitions uh, for later talks as well. So, so uh, what I will talk about is uh, joint work with uh, Budima Shinrei, who are students at Ibefell and Alam, who is a postdoc. Uh, so cluster, you know, we want to cluster things based on similarity. So here I clustered objects, which if you have been to Europe, you can like uh, guess the countries. Uh, so it's like top left is Switzerland, Italy, France, and Germany, and so on. Or, you know, you could maybe cluster images in terms of, you know, animals, or like maybe finding rescue centers in Switzerland to minimize the distance to, to hikers or something like that. So, so this is like a short introduction, <laughs> but uh, you know, in theory, we also, by the way, feel free to interrupt me at any time during the talk, of course. Uh, so yeah, so in theory, we look at often uh, in two objectives. So traditionally, I think K-medium was most popular. So it's just like, hey, I'm given n points and a distance between these points, find K centers so that you minimize the distance uh, to, to the, to the nearest center. Uh, uh, like that. Okay, so we minimize, sorry, I just had to update. So minimize the sum of distance from the points to the closest center. Uh, and you can also look at k means, which is made more popular in data science, where we just minimize the sum of distance squared. Okay, and, and we will focus on these problems here today. In fact, I will uh, actually focus on K-Median. And when I started working on this, maybe it's obvious for everybody else, but it was not clear, you know, why they were called K-Median and K-Means. But if you think about it for a while, if you look at the line and you want to open one center, then in the median case, well, the median is simply the median, which is zero, and, and the mean is just the mean. So I guess the names make sense. And of course, we're going to look at more interesting case where we're going to select many centers and we might have more complicated metrics. Okay, so traditionally I worked and uh, many people worked on approximation arguments. And in fact, it's still very beautiful open questions to understand the approximability of these questions. So, so you know, for K-median, the best bound is roughly 2.68. The lower bound is 1, 1 plus 2 over E. It's quite far away, and for K-means, the gap is even bigger. Even I think Vincent has, Vincent, uh, this next speaker has some improvement here, but I don't remember exactly the guarantee, but, but it's still quite far from the low bound, I would say. Okay, but this very hard <laughs> open questions. So, so I think today we're gonna look at a slightly easier question, although we don't have tight bounds. And that comes from this idea that we want to have explainable clusterings. So, so what does that mean? So when we add, you know, we want to be able to explain why do I have chocolate in the Swiss cluster? Well, the Swiss people eat a lot of chocolate and, and you know, and so on. Uh, so we would like to be able to explain why we have clustered these objects like they look like. And like more mathematically, we think of this as optimal clusterings can be hard to explain. They are defined by like an arbitrary Voronoi uh, uh, diagram. So instead of having, and here I assume that the points are in Euclidean space, so a d-dimensional uh, Euclidean space. So instead of having like an arbitrary clustering, what we think of as an explainable clustering here is that it's a threshold tree to first I select a dimension of my data and I partition the points depending on if they are less than a threshold or above a threshold. Okay, so here I selected the x1 dimension, and I say that all the points that are less than 0 0.4 goes to the left, and all the points to the right goes to the right. Okay, so now I split the points into two sets, and I can recursively split the points in. So here I say all the points that are bigger than x1 over uh, 4 and, and bigger than 0 0.6 in x2 will get up here, and this leaf here will correspond to this guy over here. So now, why is this explainable? You can think of having a data set, maybe you're interested in like, what's your risk if you, if you catch COVID or something? Maybe it's more interesting, more easy to explain a clustering if you say, if your 
H is above 60 and your weight is above 100, then, then you are at risk or something like that. So this makes sense to you know, maintain the dimensions in your clustering and only do thresholding ba based on these dimensions. So that's what we think about as more of an explainable clustering. So we have a threshold tree where we, at each step, just cuts an axis aligned cut. Any questions on that? Uh, okay. So uh, more formally, as a threshold tree is a binary tree where each non-leaf node is an axis aligned threshold cut, an unexplainable clay clustering is just one such tree where we have k leaves corresponding to the k cluster. So here we have a free clustering defined by this threshold. So any questions? So we're going to work on understanding how to construct such threshold trees. So any questions at this point? Uh, OK, so if that's clear, so then you can imagine like several questions arising when, when you believe this is explainable. So maybe the first question is the price of explainability, meaning how much more expensive is an optimal explainable clustering compared to an optimal unconstrained clustering? So if you look at the optimal K-media clustering, how much more do you have to pay to have it explainable? And if you have such a you know, structural result, you could also hope to efficiently find an explainable clustering. And uh, as far as I know, that this problem was first introduced and studied theoretically by Moskowitz and Dasgupta, that is also speaker in this workshop, Rastian and Frost in ICM 2020. And what they proved is that uh, for K median, <laughs> there is always an explainable clustering that's at most a factor k more expensive than the optimal one. And there is an explainable clustering for k means that is most k squared more expensive than the optimal one. And we can find these guys efficiently. They also gave lower bounds that uh, you have to pay a log k factor for both objectives. Okay, so there's no free lunch here. If you want to be explainable, there are instances where you have to pay a higher clustering cost. Okay, so what's our result? So, so we give algorithms that is a log uh, square k and k log square k more expensive k median and k means respectively. So this means that we shaved off a factor k on each of them. So for k median we get the log square k cost increase, and for k means we get k log square k increase. Okay. Uh, and, and then we have a improved lower bounds for k-mean instances, the price explainability is at least k. In fact, if you look at the LP norm to the power of p, the price of explainability will be at least uh, uh, p minus 1. And here you get the matching upper bound of p, k to the power of p minus 1. So it's basically tied up to log factors. Okay. And also, it's kind of nice because the algorithm, at least, is very simple. And hopefully, <laughs> if you, I, I think there will be one talk uh, this afternoon for you guys uh, that uh, even get a slightly better guarantee. So they get log k, log log k. But it's very similar algorithm. So you have a chance to receive maybe some parts of the analysis. So then I think you will understand it. So it's not too complicated. And they also run very quickly, the algorithms. They run in, in time, uh, uh, there's linear time, uh, basically in K. Once you're given a reference cluster, you actually, the running time will not depend on the data set, points of the data set. So I should notice here, that's important, that there's been very related independent work by several different groups following the initial paper by, uh, by in ICML 2020. Uh, so that's by Makara Chavin Chan, Sharkaran Hu, Esfandriani Mirokni, and Narayana. Uh, so, as I said, some people, uh, so some people get slightly stronger results, uh, and and uh, there is some slight differences in the papers. Uh, but I think it, it's fair to say that everything I say today should be credited to equally to these uh, papers that I listed there, and the algorithm is is similar. So this gives a hint that the, once people saw the introduction of the paper in ICML, if you have seen a lot of ways of how to round LPs, this was a natural approach to try. Okay. So although uh, all these papers come with a similar algorithm, 
my whole look, my conjecture is that our current analysis is not tight. So I would like to discuss that at the end of the presentation. My hypothesis, uh, like what the exact guarantee of the algorithm and the price of explainable clustering is. So maybe someone then can tell me if I'm wrong. I would be very grateful. But I tried to solve this for quite some time. Uh, but I believe uh, the the right rate is actually quite clean. Okay. So any questions at this point? So 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 then in the rest of the type ta talk, I just want to give you, you know the high level approach how to prove this price of explainability results. Then I will give the proof of one k is equal to two, explain how it generalizes to general k. And then, then I would like to discuss this conjecture, uh, and it's a nice, <laughs> it's a nice uh, generalization of uh, both and um, being a uh, question. Okay, um, so, so general approach. We will focus on k-median here because it's, uh, it turns out that this is the cleanest one, uh, and the algorithms are the simplest in this setting. And this is because in this important note here, so it's. Also, some papers looked at the, the other setting, but here we will look at the L1 norm. Okay, so distances are defined by the L1 norm of points. So we have points in d dimensional Euclidean space, but we look at the distances uh, in the uh, L1 norm. Okay, so that means that uh, if the stars here denotes the cluster centers and the points, the points uh, that we want to cluster, then the distance of this point to the cluster is just a here. The distance from this guy to itself is E plus F. So it's the L1 norm or the Manhattan distance that we're going to consider. You may think that L2 distance is more uh, natural, but the L1 norm, trust me, is nicer for this problem because the algorithms become much uh, cleaner. And, and I think it's a nice. OK. So yes, yeah, so the cost of the uh, clustering that I uh, uh, drew here, which you can think of the optimal clustering, is just uh, the sum of these dotted edges, so A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F. Now, remember that an explainable clustering is defined by this threshold tree with K leaves. So now you can think of the, how do I produce such a tree uh, and the K clusters. So all the algorithms I've seen, they work as follows. You take a given clustering that is unrestricted. You can take the optimal clustering if you like, but that's hard to find. So a, a constant factor approximation is easier to find. But take any reference clustering that you start with. So you have this, uh, uh, in this example, you have the blue center, the red center, and the green center. So this is not an, necessarily an explainable clustering. So now what we're going to start with is to build up our tree. We just forget about the points in some sense. So now I will find a threshold cut that splits these uh, centers into two sets. So in this case, I found a threshold cut that have the blue center on the left, the red and the green center on the right. So I have the threshold cut that split the blue center to be by himself to the left and the red and green uh, together on the right. And then I recurse on the smaller instances, which still have more than one center. So now I will split the red and the green in some way to get three leaves, one leaf per center. So all the others I know that are not uh, uh, producing, like we will also see a talk that produces bigger trees uh, that have more than K leaves. But if you're going to produce K leaves, the others that I know, they start with a reference clustering. And then they produce a threshold tree that has exactly one leaf uh, for each individual center that you gave. Now the cost increase comes from the fact that, for example, some points like this one here, right, this red guy over here, he got separated from his closest center. So now he has to pay a bigger cost in the explainable cluster when he goes to the blue center. Or this green guy here, he has to now pay the cost for going to, no, not to the green. He has to pay the cost for going to the, to the red, which might be longer. OK, so that's the algorithm uh, going to work like that. You're given a reference clustering, and we're going to produce a threshold tree that has one leaf per center. And in fact, our algorithm that we're going to present doesn't even look at the points 
uh, from that point, uh, from that stage. So we are just, you can think of it as given the K centers, the stars, and we're going to output the tree with a, a leaf per center. Okay, so now let me explain how this works for two clusters. Okay, so I have two clusters in two dimensions. So as a, maybe this is the input reference cluster I was given, so blue and red. So what we can observe already in two dimensions is that no matter how I cut, meaning separate the blue and the red centers, I will misclassify some point. If I, you know, if I cut here, I will misspecify this blue point. If I cut here, I will misspecify this red point. If I cut here, I will misspecify that, and, and so on. So there is some price of, for explaining even this sample case. Okay, so when you have k equal to two, there is some price you have to pay. What we're gonna prove is that there is an explainable clustering always at most two times opt in this case, when the k is equal to two. And how am I gonna do it? Well, we're gonna see. So, um, so let's try to prove that. So remember, the cost of an optimal unconstrained clustering, the one we were given, the reference clustering is just the sum of dotted edges, okay? So oft was equal to this A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F. Now, if I would like to separate, you know, I want to output a threshold tree, right? With one leaf for the blue guy and one leaf for the red guy. So it doesn't make sense to have a cut over here because it doesn't separate the two centers. So any cut along the X axis, okay? That should start, should be somewhere in between this guy and this guy. So somewhere in between there, I can make my cut. Okay. You know, I could cut here, then I separate the blue from the red. I could cut here, then I separate. But it doesn't make sense to cut outside there because then I don't separate the centers. And similarly, if I make the cut along the y dimension, I, I can cut from here up to there. So this, let's call this L2. So that it makes sense to cut here, here, then I separate. But if I cut outside, I wouldn't separate the two centers. So basically, this defines a bounding box of val interesting cuts, the cuts that would separate the two centers. Either I cut along the x-axis inside the L1 interval, or I cut uh, inside the, the sequence uh, the, on the y-axis uh, inside the L2 interval. So now, of course, I can also write, uh, so that's a nice picture, I can also write A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F, that's just the same sum where I divide by L1 plus L2, the size of the bounding box or the size of the sides, and times the size of the sides. Okay, I didn't do anything interesting, right? Just divide it and multiply by the same thing. But now, if we look at this here, and if you stare at this, maybe you won't see it now, but if you stare at this part uh, for a while, you will see that this is equal to so that part is equal to the expected number of points separated from cluster center, closest cluster center. Okay. So this is exactly equal to the, if we take a random cut, sorry, sorry. So if we take a random cut, this equals the number of points that we will separate from, uh, from, uh, 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 from the closest center. To see that, notice what's the probability of separating this point from its closest center over there? So you know, we would need to select a cut that goes through the A edge, right? That's the only way to separate this guy from the center. And the length of the A edge is exactly A, right? And the total length of the intervals where I select cuts is L1 plus L2. So the probability that I would cut this dotted edge is L1 plus L2. And in general, the number of clients that I separate from the closest center is exactly the number of dotted edges that my cut would cut, that my, that my line would cut, I would say. And this is, turns out that if I select a uniform at random cut, this would be exactly the sum of these, the length, the sum of the cost of the clustering over 
the length of the size of the bounding box. Okay, so that will be one observation that we can use. So if we take a separating cut, uniform at random, then is, this is at most expect the number of clients separated from their closest center. All right, so that's the first observation. Now, if a client is separated from its center, how much does the cost increase? Cost increase. Question? Yeah. Yes, qu question, yes. In the previous uh, slide. Yes. Is that, no, that, that yeah. Yeah, so, so you did this uh, random cut. Uh, so random cut, you choose either cutting along the x-axis or the y-axis, right? Right. So why does it, why is it A over uh, L1 plus L2? Like if you choose y-axis, it's only A over L2, right? Oh, I see. So, so you know, <laughs> we will choose a cut with, at uh, x-axis with probability L1 over L1 plus L2, and y-axis with L2 over L1 plus L2. So you can think of all cuts have the same probability. So now you first select, you know, if I'm going to cut through x-axis, we call it L1 over L1 plus L2, and then you select a uniform at random cut among the interval of length L1. So this yes, all the cuts have the same probability. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> so it's not that suppose you have a bounding box that is very uh, tall and thin. So this would be L1 and L2. Then you shouldn't select an X cut and a Y cut with the same probability, right? So there's much more uh, Y cuts than X cuts. So you should take that into account when you. So what I mean is that you really, among all the possible cuts, there's many more Y cuts than X cuts. I select one uniform at random. And that turns out that you should select an X cut with probability L1 over L1 plus L2, and a Y cut with probability L2 over L1 plus L2. Perfect. Very good question. Okay, so, so we know that expect the number of separate clients is at most opt over L1 plus L2. Now, what is the cost increase if client separated? So, you know, if we were unlucky and separated a client, suppose we selected this cut here. Okay. And that's separated, for example, that client from its closest center. We need to bound how much the cost increase of this client is when it's assigned to this other center, the blue center instead of the red. But in the worst case, right, we can always, uh, this cost increase will be these uh, two, uh, two lines, right? But we can always up about the length of the X line by L1 you know, you will never walk further than the bounding box in the x direction, and you will never walk further than the than the y direction. You know, L two in the y direction. Okay, so the cost increase if a client is separated is upper bounded by the length of the size of the bounding box. Okay, you will never. You know, that's how we define it, right? There is no center further away than the size of the bounding. So if you're separate from your close center, in the worst possible case, you will have to go the whole bounding box to find your other center. Okay, so that's our second uh, 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 observation. And now you combine the two, okay? So if I take a random cut, then the expected the number of separated consoles times L1 plus L2, which is the cost increase. So this is the cost increase at most the cost increase of each separated guy, then it's at most opt. Okay, so I increase the cost by at most opt, and this follows that there's an explainable costing of at most two times opt. Okay, so I started with the cost of opt, I increase it by at most of opt, so I get two times opt. Okay, so there's two ingredients here. A random cut separates few points as a function of opt, well, opt over the side lengths of the bounding box. And now the cost increase of separating a point is at most the sides of the bounding box. Okay. So that's the, the two case. 
So now we can uh, now we can continue. Yes, a good um, remark here is that this also works. If I took random cuts, right? Why do I take a random cut? You could also take the cut that separates the fewest number of points. Then the same analysis work. And in fact, that's the proof from the ICML 2020 paper uh, that they select the min cut, meaning the cut that separates the fewest points, basically. But we will see that there is an added advantage to selecting random cuts. At least in the worst case. So that was two clusters. So what what are we going to do uh, uh, in, in if we have many centers? So now we will take the same bounding box over the centers. You know, and it's now we are doing in general dimension. So the bounding box will have you know the sides will equal dimension of the of the of the instance. Again, you can redo the same analysis. You will see that if I take a uniform at random cut, then the number of separated clients is at most opt over the side lengths of the bounding box. Okay, that's the same. I didn't really use that the bounding box used the two guys, right? So that the dimension was two. And then cost of reassigning a client is at most the side length of the bounding box again, right? That's the worst case. I, I, I was connected to a facility down in this corner and I have to walk all the way up to the opposite corner. That's the worst case that could happen to me if I was separated from my, uh, okay, uh, for, uh, if I was separated from my closest hand. So this means that if I take a random cut, even if I have, K is not two, and I have many dimensions, a random cost has a cost of at most opt in any case. Okay. So now you may see the algorithm. So any guesses what my algorithm will be if I, or <laughs> maybe it's hard to get interactivity here. So, so, you know, basically I will do as follows. While there is a leaf with more than one center, select a uniform at random cut in the bounding box. So basically a uniform at random cut that will separate, uh, uh, you know, that is uh, basically a cut of the center. So with at least one center on both sides. And that's the whole algorithm. So here, an illustration, I started with this reference clustering. I forget about the points. I just care about the centers, red, blue, and green. I calculate the bounding box. In this case, two dimensions is L1 plus L2. I select a uniform at random cut here. Maybe it says X1 is less than say, four. Now I have red center on the left, blue and green on the right. I continue on the, on the right side. So I update my bounding box. I select a uniform at random cut. Maybe I select X2 is at most six. And that would be my output. Okay, so that's the algorithm. And I can prove to you that uh, a simple proof is that it's at most k times opt. Okay, why is that? So we know that the expected cost of one random cut was the most opt, right? So when I start here at the at the root, I take a random cut. That in expectation cost at most, sorry, cost me at most opt. Now I got two sub instances, opt one and opt two, and if you think about it for a while. You can see that opt one plus opt two has cost at most opt. Okay, you for forget about the points that you separate. So now the expected cost of both second cuts, well, the, the expected cost of this cut here will be at most opt one, and expected cost of this will be at most opt two. So the sum of these expectations at most opt. So in fact, the expected cost will be the height of the tree times opt. And the height of the tree is at most k because we had at most k reference centers. So this will be at most k. And this is basically the analysis of Moskowitz et al. But they selected a min cut. And for that version, the analysis is tight. Okay. So basically, you show, show that each level costs at most opt. I have at most height k. So I get a k times opt. <laughs> but now, between friends, and that was also in our starting point, the intuition why random cut. So random cut also gives the same analysis as min cut. Uh, and the random cut felt good because the only way you would lose a factor k is that your tree is of height k, which means that you're separating out one center each time, right? Like the height would be k. 
But if you, in a random cut, you would expect maybe to get K over two centers on the left and K over two centers on the right. So it would be fairly balanced. And if it's fairly balanced, you would have a height log K tree. So you would get a log K guarantee. So that turns out to be an intuition, but it, it, unfortunately, it doesn't really work out that way. But that's one intuition why you would like to select a random, because when random fails, the instance must look pretty weird, right? Because you're always taking out one center at a time. OK. Any questions? Yeah, sorry. So that was just my intuition why I start to think about the random algorithm instead of the min cut, because min cut is very fragile. You can easily come up with worst case instance that would make you have a height k3. But the random, you know, would you feel like it would be uh, all, a little bit uh, more robust? So now, in order to get the improved guarantees, I, since I don't think uh, this analysis is tight, let me just explain what, uh, what the ingredient is. And to start with this, think, you know, we can just observe that we had this very loose bound on the cost of reassigning uh, a client. It's at most L1 plus L2 plus plus LD. But in fact, we could say that the cost of reassigning a client is at most the maximum distance between two centers in the instance. Because if I'm, if I'm separated from my center, in the worst case, I have to go to the center that is furthest away from this center. OK? And then you can see that the expected cost is actually the side length over C max. So oh, sorry, you can take that many random cuts and it costs at most of it. Now, if C max is big, you're very likely to separate the centers. So, so you know, you would make a lot of progress by taking one random cut. So that's the intuition. So if C max is big, we will separate a lot of centers by taking a couple of cuts. If C max is small, the cost of a random cut is not big, so we can afford to take many of them. And if we take many of them, we will still separate a lot of centers. So in fact, if all the centers have the same pairwise distance, this analysis, if you do this analysis that I will skip in the next few slides, you will get exactly log k. So the problem is when they are like uh, not... Uh, having the same distance, but pairwise distances. That's where our current analysis don't give tight. OK, so that was the refined ingredient. And here is like one slide uh, analysis showing that the expected cost is most log k, log c max over c min, where c min is the smallest distance between two centers. But I will skip this uh, uh, in uh, to, to go to my conjecture, which I think uh, if one able to solve that, I think it would be a nice analysis. So let's just recap the algorithm. While there is a leaf with more than one center, select a uniform at random separating cut. Okay. An analysis showed that the basic analysis was at most k times opt, then slightly refined progress measure, uh, uh, where we said, okay, but the reassignment is not the size of the bounding box, but it's a, the maximum distance between two centers gave us an improved uh, analysis. There is also a hack, in fact, to get this log square k uh, 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 analysis at the moment. I don't think it's necessary, but we have a hack in our analysis. It's a little bit uh, different algorithm. And you can see that this can be implemented actually in near linear time in K when we're given the reference cluster. So it's very fast. Okay, so now I wanted to look at the same algorithm. And, and I, in fact, I have a conjecture. Maybe some of the experts in the audience can tell me if I'm wrong. But I believe this algorithm outputs. <laughs> uh, so it's very specific conjecture. So I think the expected cost of the explainable clustering is at most 1 plus hk minus 1 times the cost of the input cluster, reference cluster. So here, hk minus 1 is just the k minus 1 harmonic number. OK. So I believe this is the upper bound. And, and this would be tight, because there is examples where this algorithm outputs clusterings that are 1 plus hk minus 1 more expensive than the reference cluster. Okay. And this would also be tight with respect, uh, at least up to small constants, to, to what you could do for price of expendability. So this would basically solve the question uh, with a nice guarantee if we could prove it. 
Okay. So yeah. So maybe someone knows this, if it's if it's false, I can stop. But <laughs> so 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 yeah. So I believe just selecting uniform random cuts will in fact just increase the cost by one plus h k minus one. Okay. And let me motivate you to why I think this is true. Because I have a proof for a special case which is nicely connected to balls and bin. So, you know, you can worry about the expected cost of a client, right, in this process. Because, you know, then you can appeal to linearity of expectation. So we can just worry about the expected cost increase for a single client. Let's, we just need to analyze client by client and then say the expe a total expected cost increase is just the sum of the increase of the clients. So let's just worry about one point. Let's assume our instance only have one point at the origin. And now I will look at this special case. Okay, so I have my point at the origin. Whoops, what happened? Oh, there is. Okay, sorry. So I have my point at the origin. And now all my centers are along unique dimensions. So that's the simplifying assumption. Otherwise, it would be general. But I assume that my center, I have one center here in the x dimension at distance w1 one center at the y dimension at distance w2, and one center at the w at the z dimension of w3. So I assume that all my centers lie in unique dimensions. So this means that when I take my cuts, I will always throw away one center. OK? And I assume that their order so w1 is smaller than w2, and wk is first away. So the cost of the unconstrained clustering is just equal to w1. So that's the special instance. And now the process, you know, when we select random points is just, hey, while there are more than one center, select rem remaining center at random proportional to W1 and remove it. Okay. But so now if you think about it, this can be reinterpreted as a balls and bin perspective. So let me be a little bit define this because here I wanted to prove uh, that is true. Okay, so I have k bins, and I will throw uh, uh, k minus one balls. Okay, and when I throw a ball, so we know balls and bin normally, right? We have k bins and k, well, here I have k minus one balls, and I always I have a uniform distribution over the bins. So here the process is slightly different. So here in this example, I have three bins and two balls, and my bins have different width. Okay. So the width of the first bin is W1, W2, W3. That's the increase. And when I throw the first ball, it will go to W1. We probably did W1 over W1 plus W2 plus W3, right? If you throw just a ball at random, it's, more, it's not so likely to go to the bin of smallest width. And if you throw it here, it will go with probably W2 over W1 plus W2 plus W3. And if you throw it here to the biggest guy, it will go there with probably the W3 over W1 plus W2 plus W3. Okay, so it's more likely if I throw a ball at random to go to the bin of largest width. So I throw this guy to W3. Maybe it happened to W3. Now the second guy will go to this bin with probably the W1 over W1 plus W2. And it will go to the second bin with probably the W2 and W1 plus W2. OK, so I throw it, maybe end up in W1. And what we are interested in, what is the expected width of the remaining bin? So this would correspond to the expected distance to the remaining center in the clustering algorithm when, you are this, uh, when the centers are along unique dimensions. So is the balls and bin uh, problem clear? So I have k bins, each with a width, and I k minus one balls. At each step, I throw a ball to an empty bin and the probability is proportional to its width. Think about you throwing balls like uh, when you're, if you're blind, you're more likely to end up in a bin with high width than, uh, than a thin bin. And here we're gonna prove that this is actually uh, at most one plus HK minus one times the smallest bin. <laughs> okay, so, so this is where I get. So this is at most. Uh, so it took us some time to think about this. I contacted some colleagues, but then the, the proof is in fact uh, uh, kind of clean. So it's a few lines that I will show you. So that's why I also hope that uh, 
that there will be a proof for the general case and uh, for the clustering case. I, I believe this is the worst case for the clustering. Okay, so no matter the width of the of the sec with two bin, with three bin, and with four bin, and with k bin, and so on, we can always bound the expected width of the remaining bin in terms of the the smallest bin w1. So it will be at most one plus hk minus one times the width of the smallest bin. Okay, and the proof is in an induction on k, so it's easy to verify. If, let's say k equals two. So now I will do the inductive case. Okay, so hmm. Okay, so I will split it into two cases. So first, what's so probability ball lands in W1. So I throw one ball, right? So probability that that ball lands in W1 times the expected cost of you know the instance with width bins of width w2 to wk. So it's a k minus one instance where the bins have width w2 to wk. And then of course I have to worry about the case where my ball does not land in w1. So probability ball do doesn't land in w1 times okay so if my ball doesn't land in w1 that means that i removed one of the other bins so and i only have k minus one bins left so i could you know i could here apply to the induction hypothesis to say that the expected cost of this instance is the most one plus hk minus two times w1 so here this was by the induction hypothesis here okay so i have an instance where I have k minus one bins, but I still have the smallest guy to be w1. Of course, it's tempting to do the same thing here, say that the expected cost of this instance is most w2 times one plus k h k minus two, but that doesn't give you anything. So that's not a good idea to also use the same induction, use the induction hypothesis up here. Okay, so that's why I only used it where I had w1 left. Okay, so now, <laughs> I will upper bound this guy by at most one. It's a probability after all. And then I will worry about this guy, probability ball lands in W1. Well, that's exactly equal to W1 over, over the sum of width, which we define to W1. So I will have that this at most W1 over capital W, the expected cost of W2 to WK plus one plus hk minus two times w1. Now we have to worry about what's the expected cost of w2 to uh, of the instance where my width bins is w2 to wk. So I have this situation, I have k minus one bins where the smallest is w2, then second smallest w3 up to wk. And I'm wondering if I throw now k minus two balls, what's the expected width of the remaining bin? So notice that a bin of what that is wide is always more likely to be removed. So you know the probability that this bin survives here is at most one over k minus one, right? You know, if they all have the same width, all the bins are equally likely to survive. So they all survive with probably one over k minus one, be the last bin with one over k minus one. But if they have bigger width, they're less likely. But this means that we can upper bound this cost here. It's at most W2 plus W3 over K minus one. Because if you increase the width, you're just more less likely to be the last standing bit. Okay, so this is at most W1 over capital W, W2 plus WK over K minus one plus one plus hk minus two w1. But now these guys cancel out w and this sum here. So now you get this equal to w1, one over k minus one plus one plus hk minus two. Well, that's equal to w1, one plus hk minus one. So that, that's it. Maybe it went a little bit quick, but uh, at least I can convince you that it fits on one slide.
<laughs> so, <laughs> and, and this turns out to be tight, and 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 uh, the tightest sample is when w1, let's say, is one, and all the other ones are the same, going to infinity. So this would be a tight example that algorithm is not better than one plus h k minus one, but I think that it's one plus h k minus one, uh, even in the general uh, clustering case. Okay, so summary and some open problems. So we came, uh, experimentally comes with a price, but it's lim limited. The algorithms are simple, right? Uniform at random and give uh, close to tight guarantees. And I conjecture that at least for K-median, it gives tight guarantees. Uh, I would, I, I like this question. So can we prove, if it's true, right? It's a very nice guarantee. It's, that's, it's cool to have like this uh, clean guarantees for this problem. Uh, and one question we want to understand, but we haven't understood it, what if we allow for, you know, a limited number of dimensions in a threshold cut? And, and unfortunately, the lower bounds um, for explainable clustering algorithms ex are extremely clusterable instances. So they are like clusters that are very, very far away with small radius. It's trivial to cluster them in an unclusterable set, in an unexplainable setting. But I wonder if there's like some natural assumption here that would allow us to prove that that uh, that explainability uh, doesn't come at so high cost for reasonable for most reasonable instances. Yeah, and I I, I like this uh, concept, but uh, I I, uh, I haven't been able to formalize and it, <laughs> it would be nice to have other problems where we could discuss explainability. Okay, so thanks a lot for your attention. Questions? Uh, hi, Ula. Um, if you know, let's say for two dimensions, like the sum of two features to be at most 0 0.4, do we know anything of the, in this case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so in fact, uh, uh, I, I don't remember who, but one of the simultaneous papers, so at least one of the simultaneous papers look at bounded dimension cases. So uh, I think for, hmm, uh, I think they have, uh, actually for K-median, I think their guarantee is independent of K when the dimension is fixed. About so that's a good question, but it, uh, it's already uh, addressed. Uh, to allow for uh, a combination of two features, whether we can. Uh, so right now the the cuts are through one dimension, like uh, the height of the. Yeah, that was one of my open questions. Like, of course, if you're allowed to use any combinations, you can recover them. Then. Uh, well, okay, so we have to be careful. So if you're allowed to use any linear threshold cuts, at least for k-means, you will be able to get a constant. Because uh, that is like you have a constant factor hierarchical clustering for k-means. And you could always, then you can like separate two clusters by not losing anything. Because, you know, a hyperplane is the best way to separate two clusters. Uh, uh, for k-means. For k-median objective with L1 norm, that's not true. So in fact, it's you could also think about the k-median case where you have arbitrary linear threshold functions. Uh, so in your tree, what, what's the guarantee? Right. So, so, uh, so it's, it's uh, less uh, clear there. So Ola, you are saying that for k-mean, if you allow arbitrary cuts, uh, arbitrary hyperplane cuts, then it's constant for any k? Yeah, because, well, I, I haven't written it out, but I'm almost sure. So why? So if you have k equal to two, the optimal way of separating two centers is a hyperplane. Okay, so you can always optimally separate two centers. Now there is this constant factor hierarchical uh, k-means algorithms that like, uh, that you know merge 
center for many different cases. So basically, you st you take such a cluster and you separate the root of the root optimally, and then you recurse on on the on the on the mm -hmm. hierarchical cluster. But I don't know exactly the guarantee you will get. It's probably high. so you know. Yes, it's could be interesting to understand exactly. Well, first, if I'm right, what I'm saying, and then what is the constant you will get? <laughs> More questions? Uh, so I have a question. Uh, so you were comparing the uh, solution, the like this uh, solution of the randomized algorithm with the optimal vanilla clustering, right? So does it make sense to compare it with the optimal explainable clustering? And uh, is it possible to get any better guarantees? Yeah, good question. I got that once before, and I still don't have a good answer. So <laughs> I don't know if it's easy to find a, like a good lower bound of explainable clusterings, but I think that's a very nice question that I don't have a good answer to. Thanks. <laughs>